And now, for a conversation produced by our underwriter, Foundation Medicine, about molecular profiling in oncology, please welcome Dr. Brian Alexander, the CEO of Foundation Medicine, and Dr. Pamela Coons, Associate Professor and Division Chief of GI Oncology at Spilo Cancer Hospital, Yale Cancer Center, and Vice Chief of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Medical Oncology. Hey, Pam. Hey, Brian. How are you? I am good. So um, the title of the, the presentation, I think, is really helpful because when we talk about um, personalized cancer care, precision medicine, I mean, all of medicine should be kind of precision tailoring to the, to the characteristics of the patient. But I think what we're here to talk about is how molecular profiling has impacted personalized cancer care over time. So, so where are we today with personalized cancer care? So, I, you know, I think precision medicine and personalized cancer care, the definition has really evolved and changed over time. I mean, I remember even beginning my training, really we only had cytotoxic chemotherapy, and that still was somewhat personalized. We knew that certain chemotherapies worked for certain cancer types, but really to fast forward now, 20 years later, we have more targeted therapies that target specific genetic changes, um, and we have immunotherapy that harnesses the power of the immune system. So I think the definition of precision, precision medicine has also evolved. Absolutely. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I think about foundation medicine started in 2010. That was my, when my clinical practice also started in, in 2010. And I think I've seen such a change in, in clinical practice over that time. I, I'm a radiation oncologist and I treat brain tumors and you know brain metastases, anything over four, three or four brain metastases getting whole brain radiation therapy. Um, and then all of a sudden you started having these targeted agents and people with 20 brain metastases like were responding to those. And so then it kind of like changed completely the way you thought about, um, about how to treat a patient. And there wasn't, a, there's, you kind of had to go back to first principles often. Do you yeah. Are you finding that in your clinic? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, as we are able to personalize therapy more, we're able to tell patients that we have more tools in the toolbox. Um, we ideally help minimize toxicity if the therapy is a little bit more tailored. So Brian, as we talk a little bit more about personalized medicine and precision medicine, can you help define some of the um, characteristics so we can talk about somatic tumor profiling and germline testing? Can you help sure. us talk about that? Yeah, there's a lot in there and then biomarkers and just yeah. in general. So I guess the way that I think about it is, you know, a biomarker is a nonspecific term that could mean lots of different things. It's something you measure about a patient or, uh, or a disease that helps you kind of make decisions in different ways. And so if I think about biomarker testing in cancer, often what's implied is that there's a specific therapy that you're trying to understand whether a patient will respond to. So an example would be, um, I want to give an EGFR inhibitor, but first I need to know whether there's an EGFR mutation. Um, and what, what I think, when I think of a comprehensive genomic profiling or, or when we profile a tumor um, more comprehensively with genomics, it's really with the understanding that cancer is a disease of the genome and kind of understanding the myriad of changes that happen in that cancer will have a lot of um, implications across the board. So there may be a treatment selection uh, question. And so, you know, foundation medicine does a lot of companion diagnostic development with new therapies. And so if you have this alteration, you should get that drug kind of thing. Um, but there's also a lot of information in the genomics about diagnosis and prognosis. And increasingly, as we look into the blood, look, doing molecular fingerprinting to look for traces of the cancer that can have lots of utility from understanding whether to get adjuvant therapy or whether a treatment's working. Um, and then to separate out like germline from somatic, um, somatic's really looking at the cancer itself and saying like, what is it about this cancer that's making it this cancer and not a different cancer? Germline is kind of like, um, a, an alteration you may have just in, in, the gene, in the cells all across your body uh, that may put you at a higher risk for developing a cancer, or, or, um, uh, but it's not necessary. And, and often, if, if you do have a germline alteration, that can be the thing that's actually driving the cancer itself when it develops. Um, but it, those two things don't have to be, don't have to be uh, the same. Do you, do you find people get confused about all the different definitions when you talk to them? in your clinic? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I think we kind of lump genetic testing under this kind of one umbrella. So when talking to patients, I talk about germline testing as being the genes that are passed from parent to child and may represent an inherited risk. And the somatic profiling is really testing the DNA of their tumor. Yeah. And those are both complementary. And um, I actually have a really interesting recent patient case that really 
takes advantage of both. I'm taking care of a young woman who is 40 with metastatic pancreas cancer. And she has a BRCA germline mutation. So this is a gene that she was passed from parent to child. It predisposes her to multiple types of cancer, breast and pancreas included. Um, that actually has a, has a potential impact on future treatment for her. We know that with a BRCA mutation, she may have a response to a class of therapy called a PARP inhibitor. Um, she also had a blood-based um, circulating tumor DNA test that identified a different type of genetic alteration that may give us another option for treatment. So when I have patients in front of me, I really like telling them, and it's wonderful if we find these different genetic alterations, I can say I have more tools in the toolbox to mm -hmm. treat you. Yeah, I, and I think just over the next five to 10 years, it's gonna be increasingly, we're gonna leverage the, the information from the genome even, even uh, more so, and f either for different tools that are looking at it, like monitoring CTDNA in the blood, like, as I mentioned before, but also kind of increasingly complex biomarkers. So in addition to BRAC alteration predicting response to PARP inhibitors, if you have any kind of deficiency in homologous recombination, which is a DNA repair pathway, might that also um, say you might respond to a PARP inhibitor or a platinum agent? And that's all to say is it's just gonna be more complicated. And I think um, we've heard before in, the, in, in prior talks, um, the real, I think the real challenge is gonna be taking complexity that we're generating and making it simple for decision making because at the end of the day you need to use that information to make a decision, pull through that decision, be able to act on that decision. Um, otherwise, what's the good is the information for? Um, and maybe like in our last couple of minutes, we can build on that a bit. So, you know, I, I think at Foundation we think about, you know, get, we can democratize this information because anyone anywhere can order an FMI test and get back this um, information. But, but how do we ensure a new technology like this not only will have equitable distribution, but that not only is the test equitable, but like all the options that the test opens, um, how, how do we ensure that those are equitable so that you know, um, we, we're not just kind of keeping these technolo technologic advances to a small uh, sliver of the community? Yeah, I think that's such a great question and a thread I think we're seeing of diversity, equity, and inclusion and health, um, trying to promote health equity really throughout all these sessions. And you know, I think we, there's data that shows that there are disparities in terms of access to these somatic profiling, germline testing, access to seeing um, genetics counselors. And I think that really it's the whole spectrum of ensuring that all patients get access to the diagnostic testing and then potentially the treatment as well. So I think that um, you know, we all have a collective responsibility in that. I think as a medical professional, I have a responsibility of making sure the workforce is diverse. I think our workforce diversity impacts the science and then impacts patient health equity. And I think as partners in this, you know, industry partners have a role in that too. Yeah, I, and I would add to that access to clinical trials because a lot of the things that kind of come out of new information, we need to learn a lot more. Uh, give patients uh, the ability to access new therapies and then learn from their journey as well. So um, I think that's about all the time we have. So thanks so much for joining us today. It's thanks, really Brian. helpful to hear your perspectives. Yeah, thank you.